Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40K's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar. And I'm Yuxin. And we are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We have seen the rise and fall of many empires. And this month, we will be discussing the mysterious and sinister Inquisition of the Empire of Man. Indeed. This month, we will chronicle how they came to be, what role they play in the Perium of Man, with some notable characters along the way. And as usual, we will be ending this month with our Q&A, where we answer your questions you send us in the comments. That's right. But before we start, if you like our stuff, feel free to follow, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really like our boxes, feel free to join our membership program, like Sabinda Biden, our very first member. All right, Sektar, and thank you to our other two members, Hermes Skirty and Anarchy138. Well, Zektar, what are we going to be talking about this week? <clears throat> well, this week, we have our usual end-of-the-month Q&A, where we answer your questions. Indeed, brother. And this week, we only have one person that asked any questions. R really? Yes. But he asked a boatload of them. No. Oh. This week, our questions come from Hermie Skirty. And he says, ask some questions for the Q&A section. What will be the next major shock in 40k? Like the lion coming back or the gillyman? Is it time for one of the chaos primarchs to come back? Does the fact that the saviors of the empire from the past mean that the empire is dying? The empire of man is not willing to use AI. Are other races other than human empires willing to and thus defeat them? Will the machine god destroy life? Does the machine god and the necrons go together? Is it the machine god just the silent emperor? Wow, you weren't kidding, Yuxin. That's a lot of questions. Well, well, uh, for the easy ones, uh, does the fact that the savior of the empire are from... Well, Yuxin, Yuxin. Actually, the yeah. easier ones are in the back, so why don't we just start from the back and work our way back up? So, okay. is it the machine god just the silent emperor? I'm I'm assuming you mean the silent king Zarek, in which case, no. Yeah, uh, which, right actually, now he only has two focuses, which one of them is to try to keep everything alive, and the other is to try to find a way to get a flesh and blood body back for his race. Make them become the Necron tier again. Which is well, minus the cancer. cancer yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, then, at this point, like anyways, that's probably yeah. moot. Because remember, the reason why they were so cancerous was because they lived so close to that the radiation of that one star. So they expanded out as far as they have anyways. I don't think it's as much of an issue. But anyways, the next question, you said, does the machine god and the Necrons go together? This kind of what Yuxin just said kind of answers that question. The Necrons are kind of working the opposite direction that the Mechanicus is. The concept is that the Mechanicus is trying to become more machine-like. The Necrons, anyways, their their overall purpose is that they're trying to become the Necron tier again. So they're kind of going in the opposite directions. Well, some Necrons are focusing on that. <laughs> okay, the majority of them are, at least the ones that are in charge. They're still, anyways, for the Silent King, and the Silent King has popped back up again. The now, ones like that are said, for the Silent King, that is. There are like many that are just fighting over territory and killing each other and then of course there's Zerus. I was about to say Zerus is kind of Zerus is a, is is a different animal but Zerus is Zerus is Zerus. He's I think we've ranked him anyways with like our top 5 most hated people in 40k. He's he's I think part of the top 5. He is up there. Yeah, I mean he, he's up there with Erebus. <laughs> the next question, will the machine god destroy life? Now, if you're talking about the Omnissiah Yux and I kind of talked about that a little bit. We think of him more as he doesn't really exist. <laughs> He's more of a fictional character, right? Yeah. As Jeez. best that we can tell, yes, it's basically the Mechanicus is God, or what they believe. Right. And a lot of them, anyways, when the Emperor showed up, he became kind of the Omnissiah. So technically, I guess the closest that's not fictional would be the Emperor. But right. will he destroy all life? Probably not. I mean, he's just kind of a husk of a dude sitting on a golden throne. On the other hand, uh, will the thought process of the tech priest possibly kill the universe? The, well, yeah. So 
there there are particular cults of oh the machine cult anyways that are very much like oh what were those necrons called the um destroyers who literally yeah. just want to kill anything that's organic uh, I believe you and you talked about one of these guys in your uh, Dark Hunters. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there's a war called the Clusiad War, and yeah, I talk about it in my Dark Hunter boxes. They don't go, okay, we're trying to kill all living organisms because they're just like, okay, we accept like Skatari and people like that. But anything that they considered humane, they're just like, yeah. We're, we're going to try to remove all of it. Humane or human? <laughs> humane. <laughs> human, humane, kind of both. Well, no. One's, they're not the no, same thing. kind of both. Not they're the same, but kind of both. It, the way that it stated is they felt that human and human emotions basically were... Oh, okay, I got you. Right. On, right. hu- ...on the machine god. Okay, let's put it this way. They viewed humanity as an affront to the machine god. As such, they felt that they should try to eliminate all humanity. Right. Other than the ones, anyways, that are uh, that have faith in the Omnissiah and are actually trying to become more machine-like? Yeah. Okay. So, I hope that kind of answers all the questions that have to do with the machine god. Uh, I mean, it is also 40k, so who knows? There might be actually an Omnissiah somewhere floating around in space. But as far as we can tell and what, from what we've read, it, it seems to be just kind of the deity of the um, tech priest's cult. Right. Uh, the next question we got is, if the empire of man is not willing to use AI, are other races or other human empires willing to and thus defeat them? Okay, now, first off, as far as I know, I don't know of any empires of humanity or, or at least worlds or systems of humanity at this point that actually do use AI. I think most of them were pretty much wiped out either during the golden age of techno or the end of the golden age of technology or during the great crusade. Um, do you know of any that have popped up recently, Yuxin? Um, Not right offhand. The only people I think that would be using AI right now would possibly be inquisitors or rogue traders. Okay. Well, I, and even still, that's, they don't count. Uh, even still, anyways, I think that's, that's kind of a stretch. Don't you, Yuxin? AI is pretty pretty banned by the Empire. I mean, that is that is really like, no, we don't do this. I mean, that's straight up heretical. <laughs> well, of course, though, when it comes to the rogue traders, they may actually have on their crew, like, for example, Tau, which do use a lot of AI. Right, Even right. Some of their sensor packs that their mainline troops have are AI. Right. So well, and speaking of which, actually, there are, as far as we know, anyways, we kind of talked about this too uh, while we were preparing for this. But the only two races we could think of that actually use AI, and they do use it quite a bit, are the Leagues of Votan and, like you just mentioned, the Tau. Yeah. Now, can they defeat the human empire? No. They're, the they're Tau too small. are too young. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Their empire is too young, and so it hasn't grown enough. Right. And the Votan, the Rift kind of destroyed a lot of their unity. So, no, I don't think they are at this point. Well, I think the Vo- the, the leagues of Votan are too small, too. Yeah. But as opposed to the uh, – this is actually kind of an interesting point. Uh, as opposed to the Tau, who are expansionists, the Votan really don't seem to be too terribly expansionist. They kind of – they're <laughs> they're merchants more than they are um, – right massive armies of war that are trying to expand now at this point in the Adominus era they are expanding a little bit but like you said that has to do with the great rift you know causing huge calamity within their the, the structure of the leagues yeah, so, so they're, they're trying to find new places to mine pretty much well and live because there's a lot right. of planets that are completely destroyed no not to mind you that that doesn't cover all of them there are still some groups that are very expansionist but yeah, but they're, they're, in general, the expansion but, is caused because of the Great Rift and like plants being destroyed and needing new places to mine. Right. What? What? Like I like I said before, though, both of these two races of Xenos are are they're just they're too small at this point, anyways, to really try to take out the human empire. It's just they're they're too small. Now, who knows? In another ten thousand years, will the Tau be large enough to actually, you know? 
try to tussle with the Empire of Man, who knows? Right. I, that's that's a long ways down the road, though. Anyways, when we let's get to the rest of these questions real quick. Actually, not real quick, but they kind of all the rest of these kind of all gel together. So I think we should just kind of tackle all three of them at the same time. Okay. So what will be the next major shock in 40K, like the Lion coming back or Gilliman? And isn't it time for one of the Chaos Primarchs to come back? And does the fact that the saviors of the Empire are from the past mean that the Empire is dying? Well, to answer that last question, the Empire is going to have been dying since the Emperor took his seat on the Golden Throne. Even possibly That's before that, technically. Well, yeah, okay. The great, uh, the the Horus Heresy, kind of. Since the before. end of probably the Great Crusade, when he mm -hmm. decided to leave the forefront, it was starting to deteriorate pretty quickly after that. Well, okay, no, it was it was once Horus turned traitor, because there was like a short period after the triumph of Ulanor where Horus actually did continue to expand. The rest, they they continue to expand for a while, and then yeah. you had that whole thing on Davin, and then he becomes traitor, and by that point, anyways, things are not going swimmingly. Well, but, they it's sort of inference that they weren't going very swimmingly before that. It's just basically almost everything stopped at that point because up till that point, he was starting to get more and more swamped with bureaucrat crap. Yeah, but so it's speak. the Imperium so was, it was still slowing advancing. down progress. It was still advancing, Euxin. I mean, even anyways, before Daven, I mean, the first book anyways of Horus Rising, part of the Horus Heresy, it literally I mean, they take back. four planets in the course of that whole book. They're still advancing. My point being, though, is that they were already starting to slow down at that point. Not that they had already stopped. They were starting to slow down because of the fact that bureaucracy was starting to catch up to it. No, well, okay, that that's that's debatable. But what's definitely not debatable, and I think you will agree with me on this, is, is that by the time the Horus Heresy started, the golden age of the Empire and its advancements were just done. Yeah. It never it never reclaimed past that. The closest they got, I guess, probably would be the Great Scouring, where they did actually take back a whole lot of those planets, but they didn't take back everything. And ever since then, anyways, it's been the empire has been more along the lines of slowly decaying and just really honestly, what they're really fighting at this point for anyways, is to kind of hold their own. Right. Kind of keep what they already have. What's been falling apart. Right. Kind right. of like the um, Sabbath crusade. Right. Or the, the Achilles crusade or, I mean, or any of the crusades. Now that I think about it, <laughs> but one of the things that is kind of interesting is the fact that Gilliman is really is trying to, you know, get them back on the right track, which is nice. But the, the thing that I find interesting is, and this is what we're going to kind of get into with, isn't it time for a Chaos Primarch to come back? Or what's going to be the next major shock? And at this point, anyways, like you mentioned, the Great Rift. So the Great Rift has literally split the Empire of Man in two. You've got the one side, anyways, the, the Astronomicon is still active. So warp travel is still reasonably safe. And then you have, reasonably, I say in quotations, and then you've got the other side of the Great Rift where they can no longer see the Astronomicon. So getting around anyways, warp travel is incredibly dangerous. So it's moving a whole lot slower. It's the dark side of the moon, pretty much. Right. So, and by the way, the two Primarchs that we have at this point, the Lion is on one side of it, and Gilliman is on the other side of it. So that's, by right. the way, one of the reasons why they probably haven't come in contact with each other yet. Now, when they did release the lion, when the lion came back, another Primarch came back around the same time. And it was a Chaos Primarch, and that was Angron. And he's uh, he is steroided up and ready to go. <laughs> that's the best way to describe him. I mean, <laughs> you, want, you want to say what ended up happening with Angron? It's kind of insane. Somehow. He has come to the point where originally he was banished by 13 Grey Knights. Now he's able to take out like 70 of them. Yeah, and we think a lot of that has to do with, quite frankly anyways, being warped up by the Great Rift. I mean, he's juicing on all that warp material, man. <laughs> I mean, at this point, though, there here's the other thing, too, is, is that the first time... Okay, so what my brother is referring to is the first War of Armageddon. 
which we will go into great detail on later on, but we're just, we, we don't have the time to get into all of that right now. But during that point anyways, like he said, he was taken out by what, 13 Grey Knights? I think. And I mean, I think he killed all of them, but they ended up kicking him back into the war. Mm, no, I think one of them lived. One lived? Okay, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but this time anyways, when he popped back up, by this point anyways, the Great Rift had kind of opened up and the warp is kind of seeping into the material world. So not only that, but when he was on the war in the War of Armageddon, well, he's, I mean, it's Angron, so he's already, you know, hopping mad. <laughs> he came back this time anyways. It's almost like he's not even lucid. It's almost like a rabid animal. There are times where he does show some lucidity, but most of the time he is just like, it's more of a, he's like a force of nature. He is right. more incarnate pretty much, which kind of cool, quite frankly, but... <laughs> and he has come face to face with the line. But the other thing, though, that's interesting about him at this point is, is that every time that they kick him back into the warp, he shows up like what? It's like eight days later on the eighth hour, uh, or the eighth second or something like that. It's like either eight months or eight weeks, eight days. And it yeah, it doesn't. Well, it's eight because that's it's corn. all eight. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that is the last primer that showed up now. When we get to this, what will the next major shock be in 40K? We kind of talked about that. And we had some kind of interesting concepts. The, the simplest one we came up with was the line ends up controlling the top part of the Imperium while Rabute Gilman takes control of the bottom part and they figure out how to get rid of the rift. But now you have two empires. Right. Which could be fairly interesting. But then that got us to thinking <laughs> about our favorite buddy, Alpharius. And he could be the next, you know, chaos Primarch to show up. And he's just been slowly biding his time. And this is the perfect moment. And now he has <laughs> conquered pretty much the northern side, anyways, of the empire. So when they fix the Great Rift, now all of a sudden Alpharius has his own empire. <laughs> and this is when we also find out that all of those chapters that nobody knows where they came from, we find out where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, you know. Those, those ones that were around and then disappeared, thought to be destroyed, and they pop out cup. Hmm. <laughs> Where did they come from? Or the other thing, though, was is that if you call it right, uh, okay, we didn't really talk about this when we talked about the Horus Heresy, but the Raven Guard. So after the drop site massacre, when the Raven Guard get complete, almost wiped out completely. Right. Right. And then Corvus Corvax comes back to Terra and he's like, I need to talk to the Emperor. I need more troops. So he actually ends up getting an audience with the emperor, which was kind of surprising in and of itself. And the emperor is so busy. He's just like, here, take this. <laughs> and he gives him pretty much, it's it's almost like Primaris gene seeds, which is kind of insane when you stop and think about it. And then the, he goes back to his home planet and tests it out. And the first guys that pop out are these super awesome, pretty much Primaris space Marines. And he's like, cool, we'll make yeah. a whole army of them. Well, unfortunately for him, when they left S1-5, there was a bunch of Alpha Legion guys <laughs> that disguised themselves and went back with them. So when they including saw... Including Omega, to... I believe. <laughs> including <laughs> one of the Primarchs, yeah. <laughs> so they see this and they're like, uh-oh, we can't have that happen. So they actually corrupt the gene seeds that the Emperor had given Corvus Corvax with demon blood. So then all of a sudden, these guys that pop up, you know, the, the new... Raven Guard are almost like the best way probably to describe. They're almost like Wolfen, right? But more they like, like become mutated creatures, right? So everybody's freaking out about this while that's taking place. Omega steals the Zine seeds, and then he corrupts them. Even as part of them, he keeps. And then he yes. takes another part of it and he corrupts it even more and goes, "Oh, this is by the way what the Emperor gave to Corvus Corvax. Here you go, Horus." And Horus is like, sweet, now we can make our own legions. And it never worked because... He hands it on to Fabius Bile, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he could never get it to work. We're because... the foremost experts in, you know... <laughs> Genes, yeah, seed research. But it never really worked because they had corrupted it so much. But Omegon had actually kept part of that gene stock. And he actually had a scientist or it was a tech priest that said... Oh, we can definitely, anyways, get rid of the chaos blood from this. But that's the last time we ever hear of it. 
which kind of makes sense since I assume that they're able to synthesize the information of what they were injecting in. Mm-hmm. So they could just go back off of that. It's like, okay, so what would this cause to corrupt it? And then they could just work reverse engineer, basically. Right. So, but we just got to thinking about that and we're like, you know what? This would also, anyways, be kind of cool how Alpha Legion actually takes over the northern part of the empire. It's because all of a sudden they've got all these pretty much primaris alpha legionnaires <laughs> and he's been well, he's been slowly making them in you know wherever he's been hiding for all this time and now they just kind of come in like a wave and conquer everything but the other interesting part was is that one of the things that we've talked about before when we went when we talked about alpharius and omega was the concept of were they really for chaos and both you i think you'll agree with me you we, we kind of agreed that we didn't think that they were for chaos, but they also weren't for the Empire and the Emperor. Yeah. And th- there is text written by Mike Brooks mm-hmm. about some of the groups of Alpha Legion that are out there. And their viewpoint is basically we are going to rip out all corruption from the Imperium. Mm-hmm. If it dies, it dies. If it lives, it lives. This is just what we're going to do. Right. And they actually have a tech priest also. And they have a couple bodies of primary space marines. And no, no. they have their wonderful tech priest who knows a few things about gene seeds. <laughs> so they may also end up creating some. So. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking anyway. So by the time the Great Rift anyways kind of slowly shrinks back into the Eye of Terror. All of a sudden anyways, you have this northern empire that A, doesn't want to be part of the Imperium anymore, but B, is willing to negotiate and and try to, you know, be an empire. And it's three, led by a Primarch, who is probably as cunning as Rebute Gilliman. And four, the most interesting part about this, the most interesting part about this is is that the lion is on the north side, right? Right. And he's worked with, one of the people he worked with actually quite a bit when, when the Great Crusade was going on was a guy by the name of Alpharius. Right. So it would be kind of interesting to see anyways where the line ends up anyways in this whole thing. Of course, I'm sure Games Workshop isn't created enough to actually, you know, do anything like this. But (laughs) well, what would make it even better is connecting, like, for example, since they do have this gene seed, it's like, okay, what about all of those unknown foundings for the uh, for the Raven Guard chapters? Right. Okay, we don't know how they were founded or where they were founded, but they're here now. Okay, are they actually Raven Guard or not? Yeah, <laughs> or maybe they are Raven or Guard. Like, but they're for they're example, has been the by Alpha Legion. So Alpha yeah. Legion pretty much does this like like Manchurian candidate thing, and all of a sudden they're just like, "We are Alpharius." It's like, uh uh-uh, oh. <laughs> like the Carpredons, they disappear for like thousands of years. They pop back up. It's like, yes, we are on your side. It's like. We don't have really any background, and your main person they focus on is called, I think, like the unseen or something like that. They don't even remember what he looks like. Like, hmm, you have some Raven Guard genetics there, but you don't know. Hmm. Well, it's not or- just the Raven Guard, by the way, that have these chapters that kind of randomly pop up. Yeah, there's other. The, the, I mean that. That one and the raptors are the two that, though, right off the top of my head, that pop off because the raptors were thought to have been destroyed for like 2,000 years and they pop back up. Yeah, there were a couple, I believe, anyways, of the blood, the blood angels factions. There was also actually quite a few of them, anyways, were from the what was it? It's it's called the oh shoot, it, it was the it was like the faulty founding or something like that. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? The dark founding. I think that, yeah, that might have been what it was called. Like That's the where the, founding. the Minotaur showed up, and there was a bunch of them anyways where they tried tinkering with the gene seed, and it, like, screwed up everybody that was in that founding, and a lot of those guys also disappeared. Those, right. those are the ones of the Lamenters that popped up. You know, the guys with the worst luck on them. <laughs> in the Milky Way yeah. system. Yeah, those guys. But more than likely, I mean, we, we also kind of discussed this, more than likely... Probably the next Chaos Primarch, we kind of want it to be Alpharius, but more than likely, it's probably Lorgar is probably the next guy showing up, right? Well, that would be the next one that would be truly interesting and major shock would be Lorgar popping back up. 
basically he's been hiding in this cathedral for almost the entire time that he's been exiled. Not only that, but the interesting part about that would be is that when Lorgar shows up, that, that means Corvus Corvax will probably show back up again because he's been hunting him the warp for all this time. And another weird thing is, is how is Lorgar going to actually affect things? Because remember, the last time that we left him, he was actually, he tried to kill Horus. Right. Because he thought that chaos shouldn't be in control. You should be controlling chaos. It was a little so, bit more complicated than that, but yeah. Yeah, but the simplified, it was kind of that was his viewpoint. And so how is he going to fit in coming out amongst everything else? He'd probably get along with Abaddon pretty well, just simply because Abaddon, Abaddon also was under the same concept about Horus after he'd spent a lot of time in the warp was the concept that Horus was being controlled by chaos and he swore kind of that he would never have let that happen. So right. he has a very firm grip on, you guys can help me, but that's about as far as it's going. Right. So regardless, thank you for the questions, Hermes. And if anyone has any questions they forgot to send in this month, don't worry. We do this at the end of every month and would love to hear from you. Just leave your questions in the comments and we'll get to them next month. Right, oh brother. But I believe that we have some extra time this week. So why don't you tell us about probably the most famous Inquisitor of the Ordo Xenos, who is chronicled by none other than scribe Dan Adnett, a man known as Gregor Eisenhorn. <laughs> that sounds great. Now, Eisenhorn was born in 198.m41 on Dakir's world and taken in an early age by the black ships by an acolyte of Inquisitor Hapishant. He studied alongside fellow Inquisitor and apprentice Titus Endor and was elevated to the rank of full Inquisitor in 222.m41 at the incredible young age of 24. His first successful persecution was that of the heretic Lemet Seer. Carving out a stable and competent career, Eisenhorn eventually found himself being drawn into events that would change the course of his life in the year 240.m41. During this year, Eisenhorn succeeded in ending the menace of the mass murderer Murden Eyeclone, an investigation that is notable not only for bringing Goodwin Fischig and Elizabeth Bequeen into his employ as acolytes, but also for setting him in pursuit of both Pontius Glaw and the Necrotouche. For following leads from the Eyeclone investigation, Eisenhorn became tangled up with a heretical cabal on the world of Gudrun, and in fact was briefly captured and tortured by one of its members. Gorgon Locke. The Cabal was eventually broken by a full inquisitorial purge, led by Inquisitor Voke. Eisenhorn was able to recover a device known as the Pontius from the Cabal, and it later transpired that this device held the encoded brain engrams of the infamous long-dead heretic Pontius Glaw. One of the Cabal's schemes had involved arranging his resurrection. Eisenhorn held Pontius Glaw captive and interrogated him regularly before finally choosing to have the Pontius device incarcerated by Magos Burr and the Adeptus Mechanicus. This decision would ultimately have a profound effect on Eisenhorn's future. Following up further leads from the Cabal Purge led Eisenhorn into one of the most famous investigations, the Affair of the Necrotesh, a tome of chaos knowledge. Eisenhorn tracked the survivors of the heretical Gudrun Cabal to a colony world inhabited by the Xenos Saruthai. The Saruthai had come into possession of a copy of the Necrotesh and had translated it into their own language, creating two versions of this powerful chaos tome and a translating tool. The human Necrotesh tome, written in High Gothic, was quickly found and destroyed by Eisenhorn himself. Some radical inquisitors deemed this a heretical act and damned Eisenhorn for it. However, the majority of the local inquisitorial conclave, which was dominated by Puritans, supported Eisenhorn's decision to burn the tome, outvoting the radicals. Eisenhorn was therefore spared from censure and was in fact instrumental in planning a raid on the Saruthai homeworld, during which the remaining tainted items were destroyed. It was during this attack that Eisenhorn also first met Cherubel, a powerful demon host who would plague Eisenhorn and the Imperium in later endeavors. Pardon me, brother, but would you mind telling the fine people who the Sarathi are? Why, certainly. The Sarathi are an intelligent alien species who are native to a small interstellar empire in the Milky Way galaxy bordering the Helician subsector and center on the world of 56 Izar. The Sarathi and their worlds possess 
a lack of symmetry as a result of chaos mutation that is unnerving to any human who views it. An interesting feature of their culture is their apparent lack of space travel, as they rely on interplanetary warp gates called Tetra gates that are very similar in function to the Eldari's webway system. They are five-limbed, with physical resemblances to both arachnids and crustaceans. The Surathi have no optical or auditorial features, but their sense of smell and taste are much more developed by human standards. Their skin is gray and wrinkled, and their bodies are asymmetrical, a mutation legacy of their association with the Terran tome of the Chaos lore called the Necrotesh. Their limbs terminate in metallic calipers, which can perform manipulations or grip stilts to add to their height, a Sarathi cultural pretentiousness. Their faces are oblong, lacking any sensory organs save for several olfactory openings. Sarathi perceive their environment through smell and taste, and they have thus developed a fundamentally different view of the universe to a species that possesses vision in any frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. They have been observed performing a number of unusual feats such as twisting their limbs into humanoid faces, which can communicate with humans through speech, or projecting deadly energy of an unknown origin resembling lightning charges. The Sarathi blood is a gray ichor, and they stand around two meters tall, have about twice the mass of a man, and possess five appendages, like I said before, placed in seemingly random order across their body. A smaller, paler variant of Sarathi who do not use tools, seem to coexist with the normal Sarathi, although it is not known if these beings are another gender, a subspecies, a slave caste, or a combination of these or something else entirely. Now, <clears throat> getting back to Eisenhorn, in the following year, 241.m41, Gregor investigated the apparent ritual murders on the world of Samater, at first believing the killings to be the work of some chaos cult. However, it was revealed that the culprits were actually ex-soldiers of the Ostra Militarum. These former soldiers of the Sameter 9th Infantry Regiment had been driven mad by the horrors they had faced in war and were ritually killing regular citizens. Backed up by the arbitrators of the local Adeptus Arbites, Eisenhorn managed to corner and eliminate the fanatics in an abandoned and decaying building. During the resulting firefight, Eisenhorn lost his left hand to an experienced former sharpshooter. He was offered bionic prosthetic, but declined, making do with a few stump until he could have a vat-grown hand grafted on two years later. In 312.M41, Eisenhorn's best friend and acolyte, Midas Betancourt, was killed by heretic Fade Thuring during an investigation. Thuring escaped, and Eisenhorn promised to keep a watchful eye on Midas's infant daughter, Medea. Years later, when she came of age, she would follow the path of her father and join the retinue of Inquisitor Eisenhorn as his pilot. 26 Terran years later, in 338.M41, Eisenhorn began the investigation that would make him famous across the Imperium, the elimination of the heretic Inquisitor Quexos. The investigation took place in the aftermath of the disaster of the Thracian Primaris Triumph, where Eisenhorn's interrogator, Gideon Ravenor, was horrifically injured an atrocity that appeared to have been engineered to free several Alpha Plus class rogue psychers from the Imperial detention. Eisenhorn's investigation took him to the world of Econ, where posing as mutants, he and his team discovered that the inquisitorial collusion in the scheme that freed the rogue psychers. Inquisitor Lyco was discovered in the company of the demon host Cherubel. Taken aback by the reappearance of Cherubel, Eisenhorn focused his investigations upon the creature. This led him to the fortress world of Cadia, where he discovered another demon host, Profanity. Yes, damn it. That's his actual name, Profanity. And ties between these demon hosts and the missing radical inquisitor, Quexos. However, Eisenhorn's investigation was sidelined for some time by his arrest by Inquisitor Ozma for allegedly consorting with demons. Escaping, he was declared outcast by the Inquisition and forced to operate as a rogue for the remainder of the investigation. Eisenhorn sojourned with his Adeptus Mechanicus associate, Magos Burr, on the world of Sincher for some time, where he conferred with his prisoner, Pontius Glaw. During this period, he defeated a chaos cult that existed on the world and gained master-crafted force weapons. Eisenhorn next assembled a small strike group of three other Inquisitors and acted in concert with them, tracking down and confronting the renegade Inquisitor Quexos. Eisenhorn himself was the one who killed Quexos recovering his heretical book, The Malleus Codicium, 
and banished both profanity and cherubel to the warp. Eisenhorn was cleared of all charges against him at the conclusion of the investigation. In 345.m41, Eisenhorn succeeded in secretly summoning the demon Cherubel and trapped him in the physical universe for interrogation and study. It was the year 386.m41 that Eisenhorn was able to avenge the death of Midas Bentoncourt, but it came in at a considerable cost. Killing the heretic Fade Thuring cost him the lives of several associates, placed Bequin into a coma, resulting in the destruction of his personal starship. His gun cutter enforced him to use the demon Cherubel as an ally. To control Cherubel, Eisenhorn sacrificed the naive Puritan Inquisitor Bastion Vervek in an improvised chaos ritual. This foul misdeed was an important step on Eisenhorn's road to damnation. Shortly afterwards, Eisenhorn was the victim of a carefully planned attack orchestrated by Pontius Claw, who had escaped the Inquisition's captivity and decided to punish and torment his captors. Almost every facet of Eisenhorn's life was brought crashing down around him, including his career, as he was once again declared an outcast by Inquisitors Ozma and Heldane. His organization shattered, his body broken, and much of his retinue dead. Eisenhorn was eventually able to call on the aid of his former pupil, Gideon Ravenor, who is now a full Inquisitor. With Ravenor's assistance, Eisenhorn was able to track Pontius down and eliminate him for good. However, the Pontius affair did more than deplete Eisenhorn's physical resources. It also finally broke down his resistance in employing radical methods or fighting chaos and the Imperium's other enemies. He began to travel with Cherubel as his constant companion. Eisenhorn largely dropped out of sight after the Pontius affair, despite his outcast status apparently being rescinded once again by the Inquisition. He has reappeared for only brief moments in the following years to recruit new acolytes or confer with past associates, such as warning Gideon Ravenor about the intentions of the chaos cult known as the Divine Fratry. Later members of the cult discussed Eisenhorn and suggested that he may have been killed fighting their fellows, as he was inside a building that they bombed, and Eisenhorn subsequently vanished from their psychic foresight. The truth of his death has been disputed, though. Well, Euxen, what do you think of this most famous Inquisitor? He's had a very bumpy ride. Uh, I think, because part of what, I can't remember if you mentioned this already or not, but he ended up having his revenue for actually a while was uh, somebody by the name of Belquin, I believe you mentioned. Elizabeth? Yeah. She is a blank. Oh. So it's kind of interesting the fact that he'd be hanging around a demon when he also has been hanging around with a blank. Why? Uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you want a blank with you if you're hanging out with a demon host? <laughs> you know, try to keep it, you know, it's a little extra, you know, leverage on the demon host. But no, one thing I didn't mention actually about this, why she she's actually kind of interesting, Elizabeth, is because she was part of the whole escapade, which I didn't get into, which I wish I had, but when they looked for the Yellow King, yeah. She was a big, important part of that. <clears throat> and she actually helped and... connect Eisenhorn and Ravenor together when it came to that endeavor also. Right. And there, there is there is some thought, anyways, that the Yellow King might, in fact, actually be Constantine. Constantine Valdor? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> Say anything about that at all? Just let that one go off and, and sail off into the distance, huh? Okay. Well... Let's just put it this way. He was actually apparently revealed to be Constantine Valdor. Not a maybe. Well, okay, so from it's okay, from what I've heard any okay, hang on a second. Let me look this back up again. You could make the argument that it is, but you could also say this is just chaos and doohickeys. Uh Bequin and her own entourage recovered a book whose entire contents were a single name, which was apparently the identity of the king in yellow. The first words in the book were Constantin Valdor. So there you go. Now, like I said, that might very well be just demon trickery, but it could also be, it could very well also be Constantin Valdor. I mean, remember he... He disappeared. (laughs) Just kind of left. (laughs) No one knows what happened to him. But anyways, yeah, that's to me anyways, the uh the king in yellow has always been kind of interesting. There's not a whole lot of lore about him, but 
he's just he's that he's evil. Character. What's that? Just that he's kind of evil. <laughs> kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of. That's probably the best way to describe it. Kind of. Uh, one one of the theories is that he's looking for the star child, which we never really did get into a whole lot, but that whole hocus pocus thing, which also could be also, by the way, the next big reveal in 40 K the star child, but <clears throat> getting back to Eisenhorn, it's, it's interesting how he has slowly kind of become more and more corrupted. I wonder if he ever gets pulled back from the brink or if he just kind of eventually slowly goes mad or if he dies or if he died. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that could have happened too. Well, before we leave, why don't we go through our kind of our final thoughts of the Inquisition? I mean, this is our last time we can talk about them for a while. So what are you thinking, Yuxin? What do you think of the Inquisition? I think the hair to kiss should burn. Agreed. Or at least change their prerogatives or have some sort of, you know, oversight. Something. Well, their whole thing, though, is based around the ecclesiarchy, which, as we've established, is a screwed up system to begin with. Well, that's the weird part is, is that the ecclesiarchy at least has some oversight, which is the Ordo Hereticus. <laughs> and who's the oversight of the Ordo Hereticus? The emperor. Yeah, he's going to do something. <laughs> yeah. He's stuck on his chair. <laughs> so, right. I mean, like I said, there should be some sort of at least some oversight. <laughs> The other two, I think it's more of the fact that part of it is based off of how much control the Inquisitors have and how much oversight they have, even over each other, for that yeah. matter. Because I, I know anyways that it is repeated often that the Ordo Hereticus also oversights both the other two Ordos. It's like, yeah, you go ahead and tell Cotiez what to do. Yeah. Really. That's going to work out wonderfully. <laughs> Next person that comes by, what's that? Oh, it's burnt charcoal. Okay. <laughs> with, with this little pilgrim's hat on top of it. Oh, yeah, that used to be Steve, the hereticus. <laughs> he told it's me like, I was under arrest. What to him? Uh, knows that cyber eagle above him? Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, not another no. one. I'll get the janitor. <laughs> but... Yeah, just that concept that the hereticus thinks that it can oversight them along with like the Adeptus Astartes. That's the other one that I think is kind of weird. They're just like, yeah, we can tell the Space Marines what to do. It's like, good luck with that. I mean, it's been tried in the past. It normally doesn't end very well for anybody. Well, I think when it comes to the Astartes one, it, it depends. I see an aspect of it would be good to have somebody overlooking Based off of, you know, how many Astartes have actually gone sideways over right. time. You know, having at least somebody looking over them mm -hmm. to make sure that they stay in line. If they don't, then they should reach out to, you know, other chapters. Right. It's part of it is the fact that actually the Empire's too big for an organization that's that small, basically. Unfortunately, because of that, they have this overarching power in their areas where nobody can check them, not even the other Inquisitors, because nobody's there. So what you're saying is make them bigger? What I'm saying is, is that there should be more oversight on them and reduce their power to a certain mm -hmm. degree. Uh, and how you, uh, here's, here's, here's the million-dollar question. How do you do that? I mean, I don't know. That, that's the question that Gilliman's got to be asking himself every day. <laughs> well, and the other thing he has to be asking himself is like, well, if I completely remove it, what happens? Well, chaos happens. Demons will randomly appear different places because nobody's watching over that. Oh. Random tyrannid uprisings. I mean, Who could have foreseen it? Oh, wait. <laughs> this kind of goes back to a line of questioning that we did a few months back. I think it was when we talked about actually the, uh, uh, the Ultramarines. Gilliman is, and like I mentioned this, I think last week, Gilliman is trying to remove a lot of the power of the hey, ecclesiarchy. The he's trying to remove a lot of the power of the ecclesiarchy. And in doing that anyways, I think he's also trying to remove a lot of that power anyways that the Hereticus has. I don't know what he's doing with the other two. And we even, and I think it was actually a question somebody asked us. And I think it was, what would happen if Rabute Gilliman got rid of the ecclesiarchy? Yeah. 
and we thought that they would probably be absorbed into different areas. Well, that's what my opinion would was right. Here. Like, well, they may just become basically cops. I'm mean, like, uh, yeah. Well, we figured anyways, it was kind of probably was going to end up, I think we ended up agreeing on the fact that it was going to be kind of a combination of the two. The two yeah. other major uh, Ordoses would absorb quite a bit of them, but then the rest of them would end up becoming more of like undercover, like almost like the FBI, which yeah. honestly would be great. <laughs> but <laughs> far better than what they are now. I mean, a whole lot better. But when it comes to the the Malleus, and I think we also kind of talked about this too briefly, was is that with the Malleus and the Xenos, to me, they are probably the most important of the three. Malleus yeah. has been around, I mean, pretty much the Malleus was the first one. I mean, technically, right. they both kind of showed up at the same time, that one and Xenos. But the focus anyways of the Inquisition before they split into those two branches was really what the Malleus does. Right. And... That has always been a very important aspect of of how the Inquisition has worked. But and and the Xenos, I think, came along also, anyways, is very important. I mean, it came during the time of the War of the Beasts. Like, yeah, we we can't just focus on demons. There are other things out there in this galaxy that are also incredibly dangerous. And trying to kill us. Right. And then yeah. the hereticus, honestly, a lot of that I think is very much it it, it was one of those that started off as a good concept but it was put together way too fast and they garnered they gave them way too much power so now they have expanded into this massive beast that's almost impossible to get rid of right its original concept made a lot of sense right it was to make sure the ecclesiarchy doesn't gain so much power that they can overthrow the entire government which At happened the same during time though unfortunately it also turned into not just the ecclesiarchy but anybody Right. That's where it became a problem. <laughs> so, I mean, if they can kind of tone them back a little bit, I think they, that things might work out a little bit better. But, okay, so out of all three of these, who, is, which one is your favorite? Or the least despised, maybe? It's probably a better way to describe it. Um, probably it would be the Xenos. The reason why I say that is because, well, for one thing, I'm not, anything that involves demons and stuff, I... I I, I prefer not going in that area, even though I really like the Green Knights. Green Knights. Uh, cool. The Oro Xenos, though, on the other hand, is one of the ones that's, they seem to be more open minded because they're able to be more open minded. I hear you. Is that when it comes to the Oro Malleus, it's like, yeah, you're crossing a fine line if you go, I can use a demon blade. It's like, but can you really? <laughs> without becoming what you're trying to get rid of. Can you really? Where in comparison to, I can use this alien gun. Well, what will that do? I may lose a couple fingers. Okay. Or, you know, it you're puts a hole in the wall anyways, the size of a, a sofa. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, perfect. We can use this against, what are we fighting? Giant bugs. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I I think he kind of struck something that's kind of perfect there is, is that the concept that the Malleus, there really isn't a way that the Malleus can be flexible. That is a slippery slope to damnation. Being flexible, right. you just can't be flexible with a demon. You can be flexible, though, with, like, for instance, a Votan. <laughs> yeah. Or or Eldari. Or even Tau. I mean, mind you, anyways, there it, well, and so, and some Inquisitors would even say orcs. But <laughs> well, as long as you pay them the right way, yeah, yeah. And flexible is a relative term with orcs. It's just kind of point them in a direction, say go. But <laughs> we'll give you many this, teeth there, as long as you know, you run there. Yeah. But and then the hereticus is just the hereticus is so high and mighty on itself that it it's it's almost its own worst enemy a lot of times. But yeah, well, out of all three of them, I probably Theodore. Jeez. High and mighty, quite literally. Yeah. Uh. But out of the three of them, I'm kind of inclined to agree with you, the Xenos. Although I will say the Malleus, I think, are also, I mean, I might I might lean a little bit more towards the Malleus for a couple of reasons. One is, like you said, anyways, the Grey Knights are really cool. I mean, 
<laughs> the other aspect, they have rules. There is a right and there is a wrong. You know, there is no like, in-between crap. Well, and, some uh, radicals would disagree with that. But, well, yeah. but with, with the heretics, uh, the hereticus anyways, it's like, we are always right. It's like, but, but, but you could be wrong about this. It's like, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> it's like, you could be wrong about this. And they would just turn and look at you and go, heresy, burn them. You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> or, or like that one guy's just like, well, you know, if they're guilt, if they even look guilty, they're guilty of wasting my time. Yeah, Theodore, yeah, jeez. Yeah. Although, okay, I will say actually, out out of those three, anyways, I'm kind of leaning a little bit more towards Malleus. But quite frankly, anyways, when it comes to the Inquisition, my favorites are actually a lot of the minoris. I mean, the accountants, the accountants are kind of cool. <laughs> the scriptorum, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> probably the most, actually, when you look at them, probably one of the most effective <laughs> and, and yeah. realist groups. <laughs> right. Because they're also the ones that, like I said last week, they know if they shoot somebody, it's going to be a heck of a lot more strain on them in the future. <laughs> Not just yeah. the paperwork of why I shot this person, but now we have more stuff we have to cover. Right. Well, I like them, and I also like uh, the assassins of the assassins who watch assassins right. and make sure that they get assassinated the right way. And <laughs> the ones that break the rules to begin with. Right. Like, yeah. Uh, you need like three quarters of the High Lords of Terra to send out for assassinations. And it's like, this isn't really realistic. Hey, you know, there's a, a thing from Terra that says we should attack these people. Really? Yeah. Do you have paperwork or anything for it? No. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. folks, that'd be it for this week. Uh, join us next week as we start our next subject. The Nuns with Guns. The Sisters of Battle. The Adeptus Sororitas. Fantastic. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this vlog. Feel free to like, follow, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to check out the shop. We got some cool stuff there, like clothes, pillows, and hats. Yep, oh, and don't forget the rabbit suksin. <laughs> right? Don't forget the rabbits. Have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ekthar. And Yuksin. Signing off.